special moment. It's in your DNA, there's no question. We'll start with you, Jamie, just at the top. In 1998, Glory came knocking on your door. How easy was it to work your way into the playing group those days? At a time where, who were the biggest characters also around the place at that time, back in 1998, 23 years ago. Long, long time ago. Um, and you know, I have to thank the person sitting next to me as well as, as Bernd Stanger for, for giving me that chance. I don't think there were many people in football in Western Australia at that time that would have taken me on um, with you know, a limited skill set, um, not much else to add to my game apart from wanting to win. So it, it was a fantastic time to come into the club. You had local players who we'd known and grown up with, like Scotty Miller, Gareth Nave and Bobby, um, with uh, this mix of class Australian players, John Markowski, uh, Bootsiana spoke about came in as well, Robbie Trykowski. To try and break into that side was, was a challenge. Um, it probably wasn't a help that I tore my hammy in the first two weeks of training because I wasn't fit enough and I was out for about eight weeks after that. Um, but yeah, Danny Hay, Vinko Buljabasic, uh, Gavin Wilkinson as a back three. Now, you know, Fortune plays a, a lot in a, in a footballer's life and I think it was about five or six games in, Vinko tragically broke his leg. I think it was a terrible break in two places. And the opportunity arose for me to step in. Um, and if you can't, join a team like that with such great players and do okay, then you're probably in the wrong sport. Just staying with you, what I love about the game, and I never played the game, but I was fortunate in my time in the media with SBS television to go around the world and broadcast the game. And what gets in your blood is the passion of the supporters. No other sport delivers passion like football supporter. And we had a taste of that at the Perth Glory, and we still got a taste of that at the Perth Glory, haven't we? Well, it was the first club across the NSL back then that had a support base that was anything like it, playing in front of uh, up to 18,000 plus at, um, at Perth Oval, the shed, which you probably wouldn't get away with in some of the things with people on shoulders, beers going everywhere, um, but just the atmosphere that created and then that translated to the big games at Subiaco Oval and the like was, you know, I still think about grand finals and the hair standing on the back of my neck just because the raw noise and wall of noise we walked out to across those and then a deathly science, silence after one particular game at Subi as well. But the, you know, I was always someone who fed off that noise and that passion of the, the crowd and wanted to do well because that, was, that would have been me uh, two years before and watching. Let's look at 2003, the grand final victory we'd all been desperate for after we saw that 44,000 odd people at Subiaco Oval despair after being 3 0 up. Uh, you scored the opening goal, I recall that actually. What are your memories of that goal, the game and the celebration? And Mish, uh, following on from that, of course, how much pressure did you feel to try and deliver the glory a championship? Jamie, the goal and the moment. Oh, the moment was incredible. Um, I actually injured my ankle quite badly two weeks before, um, torn some ligaments, so I was on painkillers. Mish made me go through a fitness test on the Wednesday, so I had basically a plaster cast under my boot to make sure I could get through. Um, Oh, yeah, I think the odds were about 25 to 1 to me scoring that day, and this is pre, so don't worry about the ethics of it. But um, my dad had put a bet on, mates had put a bet on, scored, the place erupted, and, and looked up where my parents were, and my dad's crying, and it wasn't, you know, it was how much he'd won. It wasn't about because I'd scored. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, that's Derek. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but it, it, it just meant so much. I'd, I'd sort of made my mind up to try and, and crack it overseas after that game, and uh, it, it was my last game for about six or seven months for the glory as well. But to, to actually win one off the back of two losing grand finals was, yeah, yeah again, it's so hard to describe that just raw emotion of that moment. But then that 92nd minute or whenever it was that Damien Morris scored and you just go, well, this is it, we've done it. Mish, your response? Yeah, I think um, Jamie's covered most of it, basically. But everyone refers to and talks about that, that rather infamous first grand final at Subiaco Oval against Wollongong Wolves. Everyone remembers that. But no one really talks about the second grand final we also lost. During that regular season, we, were, we played exceptionally well. We won the league at a canter, we won the league going away. And everyone again expected us to win. Come grand final day, same, same situation, Subiaco Oval, packed to the rafters, and we get turned over 1-0 at home. Yeah? So, <laughs> Tony, to you, again. So we had to taste that defeat first before we went on to enjoy the wins, which was, this, which was the very next season. You know, and again, grand final day, so some uh, sections of the media were classing the team as chokers, 
uh, couldn't get things over the line. There was a lot of pressure on that day to deliver, and uh, unfortunately, we, we did. We did win, and, and like Jamie says, the, we did it for, for the people, for the supporters, the fans, the loyal fans, and the people of West Australia, because there always there was then, I still think it exists today, a them and us scenario. People liked to, 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 to knock us down, no matter what we did, but it was really great to win the, the first grand final for the people of West Australia. Let's go to 2004. People thought you were chokers, you were severe underdogs, and of course you delivered the fruit. Tell us about that experience. Well, again, we know that we had, we had been to two, to two grand finals, lost the first, won the second, won the league, going away. Come to 2004, and again, we, people just kept knocking us, kept criticising us. We went to, actually went to Sydney as underdogs against Parramatta Power. Um, but again, this, the, the group of players that we had, they were, they were a tight unit on the field, they were tight unit off the field, we had a lot of leaders in the team, and uh, you know, it was the last, the last kick of the game that Nicky Murcher scored, yeah. and I think it was the last kick of the, the NSL. And I'll never be able to, to prove this, it's hypothetical, hypothetical now, but I firmly believe that if the NSL had carried on, or if the A-League had started the very next season, I think Perth Glory would have gone on to dominate for a few more years. Yeah, good on you, Mish. 2004 was a very wet day. I remember being in Sydney and broadcasting that game. And I know that the players separated, but the likes of myself and Steve Nelkowski and all that, I remember that, Steve. We sort of celebrated in our own, in our own way after the game, didn't we? Um, Bert Stanger, larger-than-life character. You always need a public relations coach these days. No matter what team you're in charge of, you need to resonate with the public. He certainly did. Saying that, were you the brains behind Bert, or did he understand his football? What a questionable understanding. No, look, uh, uh, Bert... Uh, this is the first I'm asking the question. He was the front man, but you're a very, very astute football person. Yeah, but Bert, at the time, you know, he's a friend of mine. I spoke to him uh, just last week on the phone, actually. He's, uh, at that time, I think it was the best thing that happened for, for football, certainly in Perth. You know, he's just... He's this charisma that he had, this he said, large and laugh character, he hasn't changed it. That's some of that, that video that we saw had to be cut off because he said he'd like to come to, back to Australia sometime, but it's easier to go to North Korea than he used to get to Australia <laughs> these days. Yeah? So, yeah, we, yeah just, we, we had a good relationship. Uh, we, we worked, worked well. And uh, as I say, with the fact that we're friends today speaks volumes. And I won't bring up Ipswich Town in League One, Mish. That's uh, on the back burners. Kenny... You're in charge of four and a half years. Uh, a fantastic football brain, there's no question about that. You're, you're, you're doing some great job up there in the NPL now with ECU Joondalup. Two FFA Cup finals, uh, regular finals appearances under your reign. What about reflecting on your era at the Perth Glory when you got the opportunity to be in charge of our A-League side? It was interesting. <clears throat> I was assistant for a while. And then I'd left the club and then I got a call off Tony. He said, oh, can you come and help us out? And I thought, oh, great, yeah. So I had a bit of a chat and he said, look, get us through till the end of the season and then go from there. So I thought, brilliant, I'll, it's three months. I'll have a little holiday, coach a little bit of football and have some fun um, and then go back to my proper job. And uh, it lasted five years. Uh, didn't quite turn out to be the three months, but it's probably the... Some of the, you think about at the time, you love the game, you want to you get involved in it, you think that maybe that opportunity didn't come. And I think it was quite unbelievable when he actually made the choice after the three months to actually give me the job. And I think fair play to him. He, uh, he took a really brave decision and I ended up staying, like I say, for five years. I think it was the longest serving coach, apparently. One thing I do wish, I wish I'd kept the journal. I could, have made, I could have made a fortune off the stories that we'd uh, that had come out of the club. But really good time. Really, really good time. You were passionate. You were animated down the sideline. You were a fantastic thinker. Uh, what about some of the players that you had a great enjoyment in coaching? Yeah, I think uh, right across the board, even the young ones. Uh, you know, you've, you've got lads like Danny De Silva, who was a young boy who ended up going to Roma. We had G Jacob Italiano later on, who's who's headed off to Germany now and doing really well, you know, so there's some really quality young boys. And then you've got the group, you've got the crazy group, like Dino sat next to me, you know, the lads who are passionate and really drive everybody. But I think the ultimate thing is I, I reflect on my time, not just, 
not just coaching and being around like soccer. It's like we had a, and still have, a hell of a lot of good people. You know, Castro, Keo, Reddy. All these guys are like really top level and, the, and they've got a really, really high standard and they're driven and they drive everybody else. But the good thing is about it, they're good people as well. Um, I think that's what I look back on the most, that we're very, very fortunate in my time that I would actually come away from there. Chrissy Harold sat there now. You know, I would I'd, I'd class people not just as players but as friends and that's the biggest thing that I come out of it with. Always like Kenny, of course, in his tenure, there were the knives were out at times, the glory weren't performing to expectations and... I remember asking Kenny the question, Kenny, do you feel the pressure? He says, Pete, if they sack me tomorrow, I'll just go back to my job as engineering. So uh, that's how philosophical Kenny was uh, in relation to his position. Uh, Dino, we'll come back to you in a moment. But Dino, uh, coming to you now, of all the strikers you came up against, you faced head on some awesome talent. Tell us about your experience at the Glory and some of the players that you had to try and nullify. Uh, I started quite late, probably with Perth Glory. I think it was second year of the A League, and uh, came against some big names. And uh, probably the biggest one, or most challenging, I had to face was probably a person that's sitting in the room here today, and that's uh, Bruno. You know, he's uh, it Bruno was Bruno Fornaroli. He didn't pay me to say this, so it's okay. <laughs> So uh, it was really hard, especially when he first came the first year. Uh, you, you couldn't go close to him, but you couldn't also stay too far away from him because if you, if you stay too close, he'll grab you, he'll turn you, and you're gone. If you go too far, he'll turn around and run at you, so the only way to stop him was to kick him. But I, I still got uh, better off him uh, most of the time. Now, you turned your hand at goalkeeping on one occasion as well, didn't you? Tell us about that. Yes, I still, I think, hold a clean sheet, 100% record in the A-League, so thank you for that, Liam. Uh, I remember Liam was looking around the pitch and who is he going to put uh, in the goals or who is he going to give it to, and he said, well, you're the only crazy Bosnian here, so I'll give it to you. <laughs> Jamie, just a couple of final questions to our panel. Uh, Jamie, uh, in total you scored 46 goals. Not bad for a central defender that often used to go up to take uh, the corners, 15 across two seasons between 2006 and 2008. How did you reinvent yourself as a centre forward? I think it was 48, but I'll let you off at 46. Um, 48, was it? <laughs> I, think, I think Dino uh, is laughing because he knows exactly why. So, um, I, was, I was put up front because I was either going there or the grandstand. So I got thrown up front with a pretty um, clear ultimatum that either you score goals or you're not going to be in the team the following week. So I was, you know, luckily I scored. In my first game, I uh, instant respect for a striker after that because I got taken off after 60 minutes because I was absolutely gassed um, and then scored a hat-trick in the next game. So I kept my spot on the side for the rest of the season and uh, stayed up front for a little while longer. Your uh, endurance and your tenure at the Glory was just remarkable. You just kept, uh, kept coming on every uh, game and season after season. Kenny, if you had to pick out a single moment that someone said to you, reflect on your time at the Perth Glory... Is there something that stands out for you? Not so much a moment, I think a game. I think we had to play Melbourne and beat them 4-1 off by four or five goals to actually get a home final. Um, we got it to, I think it was 3-1 or 3-0, and we threw Nebo on and he put a free kick in straight away. And I'm thinking, this is on, we're going to do this, we're going to get five. And then about five minutes later, Liam Reddy's coming up the pitch with the ball, taking on about five centre-forwards. <laughs> and they took it off him and stuck it in the net. So I thought, you know what, there's one thing that you can guarantee with us, we're always entertaining, you know. And I think that was the biggest thing during my time. So that's the thing that sticks out for me. Certainly did play an enterprising brand of football when you were in charge, as Richard is doing these days. Mitch, are you... I've been involved from a media perspective. I've seen you up in the broadcast position doing some work for the ABC, which is terrific. What does this club mean to you personally? Well, it's, uh, it's part of my DNA, really. Um, I feel honoured and privileged to have been part of this club, obviously at the helm, as head coach during what was the, a really successful period for the, for the team and for the club. And I think it's a footprint. We've been there, done that. And I think this, the good times are not too far away, Tony. So keep believing, keep together, keep to, united we stand, the players stick together, and I'm sure that there'll be more success to come. Yeah, good on you, Mish. 
And finally, Dino, you had about three stints at the glory. You came, you left, you came, you left, you came, you left. In the end, you knocked up 120 appearances. And I know that the glory is still very close to your heart, and it's great that you're here today. So can you give me your reflection on your time at the Perth Glory and what this club meant to you during your professional career? Uh, look, I, my family immigrated into Australia in 98 and you know, straight away I fell in love with Perth Glory coming from a background of football, growing up in Germany, born in Bosnia. So it's, it was always in the DNA that football and coming here and uh, watching Perth Glory on TV at the time and you know, I just fell in love straight away and uh, I always set myself a target that I wanted to play for the club, you know, uh, and my family that were here in Perth, that were immigrated, we're going to be here forever, so this is something I wanted to do for the, for the home club, you know, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a story. I had an opportunity, just before I signed with Perth Glory, I had an opportunity to go to Indonesia with an with a actual contract and... Uh, I got a call from Ron Smith, uh, who rang me up and asked me for a two-week trial. So, and I actually said, I'm not going to Indonesia, I'm actually taking the trial. And I had some people say, well, you're mad because they're giving you a contract. And I said, well, this is Perth glory, and this is my hometown, and I want to play for them. And I know I've just waited for this opportunity for a long time, and now I've got it, and I'm going to do everything possible to, to do it. And so I did. I got the contract. I did... Uh, Actually, I knocked out Stan Lazaridis, uh, who was a marquee at that time. He was on my team as well, so it uh, didn't go down well. I thought uh, when he didn't come to training for the next three days, I thought they're going to tell me to go somewhere else. But he had actually big influence, and he actually said to Ron Smith, uh, so you should really sign this guy. He's, uh, he's like Tony Adams. So he's still... <laughs> He still calls me uh, Tony Adams to this day, so... <laughs> yes. Tony Adams, by the way, was a very, very good defender for Arsenal and, of course, Captain England as well. Ladies and gentlemen, these four gentlemen are written in Perth Glory folklore over the 25 years. They have made all significant contributions to this wonderful club. So I would like you to give them a huge round of applause. Kenny Lowe, Dino Julbich, Jamie Harmel and Mish Davray. <laughs>